What happened? Um, they forgot to unmute. Oh, great. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome to the... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> welcome to the afternoon, uh, the second afternoon session of the research group. I was already happily talking uh, until we managed to unmute ourselves. Um, so this uh, segment uh, is titled the non-IP world, but it uh, actually addresses a number of interrelated problems, many of which have to do with naming and addressing. And um, I was just elaborating why we have so much interest for, for non-IP components in the path to uh, our devices, something we often call last mile communication using a non-IP uh, technology. <clears throat> And um, of course, we, we all do this in our home assistant systems where we have some Zigbee lights that we control from, from a home gateway um, and so on. So this is not really uh, something new. And actually Bluetooth had a draft REST interface to Bluetooth in 2016. I don't know if that- A white paper. A white paper. Okay, I don't know what-, what whether that was any progressed uh, beyond that. Um, I think it, that didn't exactly hit the, the mark. Um, the, the problem really is that uh, in the ITF for a long time, we, we simply have uh, defined uh, IP lower layers, um, IP subnet, subnet layers for, for things like uh, Z-Wave and, and uh, um, Bluetooth and so on, which, which are great if uh, the, the devices actually uh, want to join the IP network. Uh, but the mass market devices in these uh, places run the, the uh, native um, non-IP protocols for doing their things. So what we really need to have is uh, something like, like a gateway function that allow us to put in these non-IP nodes into the, the same IoT the other devices are in, in as well. So um, non-IP devices kind of obviously don't have an IP address. So um, we need another component that actually has the IP address and I'm going to call this component gateway. 
Um, yeah, you, we all know that gateway originally was the word for router, what we call router today. And uh, so let's uh, pull this word in again. And um, what the gateway needs to do is need, it needs to understand enough of the non-IP protocol, the, the, as we call it, 127 ecosystem, when you have a non-IP protocol, you usually just have layers 1, 2, and 7, um, needs to understand enough of that to make that available on the IP side. And you, you can ima <clears throat> imagine um, different levels of, of quality, so you can make the device look exactly a lightweight M2M temperature sensor, even though it's a Bluetooth one. Um, or you can just translate the Bluetooth characteristics in, in some way into to a Bluetooth compatibility protocol that looks very different uh, from a, a OMA a temperature sensor, but in the end allows you to access the Bluetooth device's functions. So uh, one, one aspect might be just to abstract a specific 127 protocol and make that available. Uh, over uh, IP. Um, that is, of course, the operational phase. There's also a setup phase. And of course, all of these 127 protocols come with their own um, setup uh, mechanism. And we use we need to use that setup mechanism to actually integrate this non-IP device into some something that can be used as a name on the IP side, which in the simplest case is just an IP address and maybe a port number or something. Um, or uh, maybe it includes a third component, which is the, the uh, sub-device identity or whatever um, on, on the Bluetooth uh, side, on the 127 uh, side. Um, but all this needs to be managed. So, so some, some form of recording is required of which identities map to which identities uh, here. So that, that means the, the last mile protocol has to have some support for setup. And Elliot will talk about the, the setup scheme. Um, they have and some support for the actual operational uh, phase where we either can map the entire application protocol or we uh, define an access protocol to the, the ecosystem protocol. So one thing that also has been discussed a lot is uh, just using COAP as a last mile protocol. So we, we don't really care that much about uh, the use of IP. So the, our uh, narrow waste becomes the COAP uh, protocol. Um, we need something to, to be able to put uh, into the authority part of a UI to make this uh, happen. And uh, we, we have uh, two uh, drafts we can look at, uh, for example, one is uh, Christian's uh, Coab or Get um, document that, that is uh, applicable to Bluetooth Low Energy. And uh, the other one is the slip mux uh, stuff, which is interesting in that there is no such sub-device identifier. So it, it's uh, really, it's the wire that, that is the um, identifier. So this is uh, for communication over uh, UARTs. So um, yeah, the nice thing is that the, the uh, devices on the other end, the application, uh, for instance, those don't need to know uh, that this is a non-IP device. They can use a, a co-op um, protocol uh, mechanism. And um, that, that's certainly you know, one of the multiple approaches that uh, we can follow. Oh, yeah. And then, then there was this MQTT thing. Um, and we all know that MQTT is, is the, the really the project of typical non-IP protocol because it, it was designed to give you plumbing around obstacles in the IP connectivity. But it wasn't actually designed for that, but it's what people use it for all the time. 
so uh, MQTT is, is a way to build paths over obstacles like nets and, and uh, uh, firewalls. Um, MQTT also addresses notifications naturally because it's a pub sub uh, protocol and we know that uh, notifications are complex in the HTTP part of the REST world. And uh, one interesting observation is that uh, the, the peddlers of the various advanced approaches of doing notifications and state synchronization in the HTTP world have started to, to declare um, interest in, in uh, bringing these protocols together. So th there is a pretty powerful thing called BRAID, which does full state synchronization. So it essentially provides uh, CRDTs or uh, OT technology uh, over HTTP. And uh, there are, are per resource events, which are just a little bit up leveling from the server side event mechanisms that we know. Um, and um, yeah, it will be interesting to see, uh, there's the third one, I forget. It will be interesting to see um, how these various proposals uh, uh, come together and, and maybe uh, also um, how COAP compares or, or can enter this uh, big uh, harmonization. Um, I, I don't know yet, but uh, I, I would um, expect people will be very interested in following this, this work over in the HTTP BIS uh, working group. So there's the plumbing aspect that we need to keep in mind for, for uh, non-IP. And there is the, the aspect, how do we address the notification requirement? So, and, and finally, of course, uh, as, as I mentioned, if we do not, do not have an IP address, what do we use for uh, naming uh, things? Of course, we, we are supposed not to use IP addresses, but other kinds of names like DNS names on, on the IP side too. Um, so non-IP addresses that happen in the 127 protocols are like MAC addresses in GET and uh, no address in, in Slipmux. And um, th there is unlikely to be a global general mapping like with DNS where I have a DNS name and I get a, an IP address that, that often is uh, uniformly usable over the, the, the world, not always. Sometimes we have split horizons and so on. Um, but typically DNS names map to IP addresses in, in relatively straightforward ways, but you cannot expect something like a MAC address to, to map to the IP address of the gateway and uh, some, some identifier for that because MAC addresses are just uh, sprinkled out over the world. So there, there's not going to be a lookup, a lookup system that will work uh, very well. So this is just, just a teaser. We will have a little more about naming and addressing uh, later. So this was my uh, summary, and now we could dive into the specific proposals. And I think the best thing would be for Elliot to start with uh, Nipsey and the skim work. Can I ask you to drive the, the slides? Oh, yes. Um, so what's it called? Oh, now you're really asking for trouble. Uh, tie dye. Tie dye. Here we are. Yeah, okay. Okay. I want everybody to please take note of the wonderful graphics that I used on this slide. Um, so uh, we've been working on this. I've been working in this area for a little while. Um, you, know, you guys have all seen me in, working on onboarding. Um, if, if I if I were to trace my own history on this, um, I started out looking at uh, areas like Bruski. Um, I've I've done a lot, I've done a bit of work with uh, DPP. Um, I've looked at FDO. I've looked at a bunch of these things, um, and the one thing I can say is, um, in IoT there will be no king of the mountain. Um, 
anybody who tries to be king of the mountain will end up with a molehill. So um, uh, that is the basis for the tie-dye project, which, by the way, is um, it's github.com slash IoT dash onboarding slash tie-dye. So um, it's in the back. Um, I'm doing this work um, in collaboration with Bart Brinkman, who's a new IETF attendee this year. Um, Hassan Iqbal, who is, wrote his first uh, draft. Um, Rohit Mohan, who just arrived and is jet lagged, and it, he's done his first draft, um, and he'll be hackathoning with me. Uh, Doctor, uh, excuse me, Professor Muhammad Shahzad, um, who is a professor of computer science and engineering at uh, North Carolina State University, and Braden Sanford at Phillips Medical. Next slide, please. So um, we have a real practical problem that we're actually trying to solve um, with all of this. Uh, it is um, that right now, uh, many of the deployments are uh, uh, struggling with multiple enterprise applications of BLE, ZigBee, what have you. Um, sometimes the APs have 802.15.4 radios in them. Sometimes they do not. Um, often they do not. Um, they don't have a mediation mechanism within the radio. You end up using one application. Um, and it, maybe you get a USB slot, in which case you get another radio. Um, and you end up inserting dongles everywhere, which no matter how you slice it, it ends up with all sorts of parallel infrastructure problems. Um, and in particular, when you're dealing with the dongles, um, the, you know, you play a game and it's called Dongle Dash. You may be familiar with Diner Dash. This is Dongle Dash. In Dongle Dash, the first person to get their USB into the port wins. Everybody else loses. Um, and this is all within one deployment, right? So um, this is the, the first problem. So we have a sustainability problem to begin with because people have to go and buy these dongles, which means they have to be built, which means the APs have to be more complex to handle them. And then you have to have the software on the APs to manage the dongles, right? The communications paths, you have to have topology information about where all these things are. Um, and what that just means is that the actual cost of delivering a new application when it's non-IP is particularly dramatic. Now, in the grand old IETF sense, we should say, good. <laughs> Okay, um, but IP-based technologies um, have struggled in the low-power space, um, and a lot of these things are low-powered. In, um, in, in, in Carson's previous presentation, Carson, I think you had one title slide incorrect. You said last mile problem. No, we're talking about last several meters problem. Yeah, and um, so unless you're using LoRaWAN, that's true, which is the, the LoRaWAN is somewhat of an exception there, but this applies to LoRaWAN as well. There's some limitations here. Um, dongles are necessary in some cases because no AP is going to cover all, this, all the radio spectrum that is necessary in their antennae um, to be able to use whatever it is that needs to be used. So if, I, I mentioned an ocean earlier, right? It's in the what, 700 megahertz range, I think? 800, 800 excuse me. Um, you know, we, no, no AP manufacturer has a, a radio that will just, um, or an antenna that will just transmit on 800 megahertz anymore, right? It's all, it, it all works above that. Um, even though obviously we're doing, you know, appropriate harmonic management, um, and, and multiplying, but that's the hardware limitation. And this is true, um, with all of the transceivers out there, um, that are, in, that are in your common gear. So you might need some dongles in some cases, but hopefully it's, you, you use the trick of actually managing an interface the way you normally manage interfaces, which is different applications can use them for whatever purposes are needed. Well, this is the basis of tie-dye, and particularly when we talk about non-IP uh, communication. But I'm not just talking about non-IP communication. I'm gonna to come to that. Next slide, please. So this is the approach that we're trying to to come to, which is, well, let's establish an, uh, an abstraction that allows access for the multiple different applications going across a different platform. Um, so uh, 
the idea is the apps don't need to know where the APs are. If they want to, maybe they can they, they can learn that information. They don't even need to know where the devices are. If they want to, maybe they can learn that information, right? Coming back to the location model that we were talking about this morning. But they don't need to, right? If we're talking about a device that that they, they just want to communicate with the device, they don't care where it is, they just happen to know it's in the enterprise environment, then that's all they should need to know, right? A good, a, a good uh, network layer abstraction should be able to solve that problem, even for devices that are, as Karsten described, 127. Um, OK, next slide, please. So um, we're actually looking at this a little bit more broadly. Um, the first is um, uh, a provisioning operation, getting the device provisioned in the network to begin with. Um, this work is well underway. It's a draft IETF skim uh, device model. Um, and the idea, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, so you have a provisioning step. For IP devices, you still need a provisioning step. Right? You still need to authorize a device onto a network. And I reminded, uh, I, I mentioned to Karsten that we should pull back to the discovery discussion. Um, and I'm going to pull myself back into that discovery discussion for just a moment and say uh, one form of discovery is to be able to say is to be able to pre-configure into the into the network infrastructure. You might want to go looking for this device. Here's some information and you're authorized to have it because you bought the device. OK, so um, that is really what what skims about. And so one of the things you could provision, for instance, is a DPP public key or perhaps as and when matter is, is, is ready for it, um, a, a matter spake uh, key that, uh, could e that, that could be used to, to uh, provision Wi-Fi or for that matter thread. Um, the, um, uh, so for once, you're, once you're on the network, if, you're, if it's IP, as they say, go forth, sin no more. Just connect to who you're going to connect to, use DNS, do whatever. You want to do upper layer discovery, you do your upper layer discovery. You can even um, you can even borrow some of the security properties from the lower level to help you on that if you want. I'll talk about that at some point. Um, but mostly you can just do what an IP device does. Right? You need some help from the network, we'll talk about that. But mostly that's, you know, we say, okay, for, for now, let's say we're done with IP. So let, let's come back to what Karsten was mentioning earlier, which is non-IP. So I want to be specific today. I will talk about BLE and Zigbee. Um, but you could also envision um, even Thread and, and certainly LoRaWAN as fitting into a, a non-IP bucket in some instances. I don't want to overstate the, the, the non-IPness of, um, of certain aspects of Thread, but if you're enterprise environment is a v4 environment and you might want to just have a six to four gateway or something like that you could provision that and that might be the end of it for BLE and Zigbee it's a little bit different here we have devices that have no understanding of layer three they have no understanding of being able to reach beyond the local network that they're on in those cases and this is true with Laura as well um, in those cases um, you get very simple operations that can, can uh, have uh, rather complex operations layered on top. So in BLE, and I'll get more specific with BLE for now, because that's what we started in our implementation. Um, it's a GAT read, a GAT write, um, a, uh, create, a setting indications and notifications and receiving those indications and notifications. So the device control plane that you see there, or NIPC, which we call non-IP uh, control, um is is a, a today it's an http interface it's probably going to en end up being an mqtt interface at some point right and the idea is you send a you send a gat read um over http you fold it over http much the way that the the bluetooth sig had their white paper you get a response back um and but when the when that gat read gets to say that ap uh on the upper left there um it just puts it out on the wire how does it know which ap to use that's a matter for the network to keep track through advertisements of the device for instance oh yes i know this device is over here or i last talked to this device over here or i happen to know that these two ap's are next to each other maybe the device moved 
that's something for the network to worry about, not for the application to worry about. If the application has to worry about it, they have to go hunting. And the last thing we want the application to have to do is go hunting because that makes it harder to actually write an application. Um, so the same is true with get write. You send data to the, to, to, to the gateway. The gateway locates where the device is and passes the write to a particular um, AP. The AP will then put it out on the, uh, in, in the air, right? Get the response, return it. That's the basic idea. Um, so these are common, the, the idea is to have common APIs. As it turns out, um, Z-Wave and, um, and, and BLE have relatively similar semantics. How do we know this? We created, if you look at draft Brinkman Nipsey, a, um, uh, an open API model that is polymorphic that allows for uh, reads and writes to be abstracted. I'm not 100% sure that's the right approach, but it seems to be good enough. Um, and I don't know how well it will stretch to LoRa. I think LoRa is a little different animal. But I want to talk a little bit of, uh, about how the skim model fits into this. Skim is essentially a signal. It says to the network from the device provider whether that device provider is a partner, somebody in the enterprise that's onboarding it using you know, a, a user interface or a QR code or whatever, it says, here's your next step in how to handle this device. It's a BLE device. It has the following um, authentication means. It could be null, which means nothing, right? It could be um, a pass key. It could be out of bound, whatever that is the underlying authentication technology that is passed, that, that, that is used by the network to talk to the device is whatever the device supports. There's a side effect here. The side effect is if you don't want the network to have that device credential, this isn't, these aren't the droids you're looking for as uh, Vixie would say, right? So um, that's, that's one limitation. Um, but on the other hand, once you give the, uh, once you give the network those credentials, um, the network is essentially acting as a proxy to the person who owns the device, right? Saying, okay, I want you to get me this, to, to transmit this information to or from. Right. So um, that's skim. Um, so skim says, here's your next step. Your next step might be talk to this thing. You know, I'm going to talk to this thing via BLE. I'm going to talk to this thing via Zigbee, or I'm going to talk to this thing via thread. Right, whatever the case may be. And the network then knows, okay, the, 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 a communication channel needs to be opened up one of those ways. By the way, you could do the same thing with IP and say, okay, I'm going to talk to this thing via IP. By the way, here's a set of access controls that I want in place. MUD, for instance. So, um, okay, next slide, please. Right, so uh, SKIM, it's an existing protocol. Right, it, it, it's used for user management. We've turned it around and used it for device management. In fact, we've turned it around in two ways. When you do user management, the enterprise calls out to say um, a Workday or a Salesforce.com or a WebEx or, or a Zoom saying, here's a new employee or take this old employee away. It's a CRUD protocol. Create, remove, uh, create read, update, and delete people. Well, now we're doing create read, update, and delete devices from a network configuration standpoint, not from a device configuration standpoint, but from a network configuration standpoint. But that also means that the communication goes not from the enterprise, but to the enterprise uh, infrastructure saying, here's a new device. So we're using the protocol, but we're using it in a, ver in a reverse direction. We're happy to take, we just happen to take advantage of the schema that Skim provides for that purpose. Um, so. We've already defined a BLE uh, extension for this, a Zigbee extension, um, and, a, and a DPP extension. But we think it's going to be easy enough to do a FIDO device onboarding extension. In fact, I was on with Jeff Cooper. We were talking about how to write that um, with him. Um, and I expect when Matter is ready, we'll do a Matter extension. They're not really ready for enterprise. And so Cisco really is an enterprise-focused company. We haven't spent a lot of time on Matter until now, but we are beginning to. Um, so, um, and again, the underlying technology of the device governs what needs to be communicated. You know, the, the tie-dye architecture adds zero to security of the device. It tries not to take away 
uh, security either. It just uses what's there. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Yeah, uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now for non-IP devices, we have an application layer gateway. The application layer gateway, as I mentioned, is RESTful today, but could just as easily be um, MQTT. Um, and I think I really covered all the rest of this on the slide already, so let's move on. So here's a work example, um, and this is something we've actually uh, 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 tested. Um, and I want to note, the, as, as I mentioned in an earlier, right, uh, the engineer says, what's out of scope? So I'm the network guy. I'm, not, I'm sort of the stuff in the middle there. Um, and um, I apologize, there's one Cisco-ism, I think, one or two Cisco-isms on this slide. The 9800 controller is a, is a, a wireless controller. Um, the idea here is a, um, a nurse is going to talk to, is, is, going to, is going to associate a wearable device with a patient. So if, if you don't mind, I'll just stand for a second because I don't have a pointer. But there's one thing I want to make clear. Sorry for those online. Patient device. Okay. Um. Right. So the device is um, is is associated by the patient in the health in a healthcare medical system, not by not by the network. So now the the sensor is provisioned into the network by the healthcare medical system. Right. We don't know about the, the network doesn't know about the patient, right? We, we don't. It's it, we don't have um, network interfaces on human beings yet. Um, so uh, the next the next thing that happens is the device uh, turns on. It might announce itself with a, with a, with, um, with an advertisement. We'll pick that up and say, okay, this AP knows about that. We're actually going to pass that uh, information onto the healthcare medical system via MQTT notifications actually pub sub notifications, the, um, the, the HMS can say, aha, okay, I actually want to send some control information and now I'm going to use the ALG to configure indicate, uh, more indications and notifications. Mm, the, I'm sorry? ALG? Uh, application layer gateway, I'm sorry. That's that thing, the gateway there, right? So it passes, it passes a RESTful uh, request over to uh, the gateway there and says, uh, okay, here's some get, gets and sets, it goes back and forth a little bit, and now indications and notifications flow through MQTT in a pub subway from the device, but the device doesn't know about MQTT, the device doesn't know about skim, the device doesn't know about REST, it just knows about Bluetooth operations, so it sends them via its Bluetooth operations. The APs pick them up and forward them along in the system. Right. That gets back to the data receiver and the application for the HMS. And the HMS can then forward it to the, work, uh, to the nurse's station who says, oh, this guy's all right. right. If, now, key things to note, the network doesn't know anything about the health of the patient. All it knows is that the device is communicating. Right. It's the application provider's business to interpret that information. The network might be able to do nasty things with the information if it's not encrypted, but I guarantee you for healthcare information, it won't, it, it will be encrypted. We'll never see it. We won't try because otherwise, otherwise we have all sorts of obligations on our part. We don't want it, but that might not be the case in other cases. So if you really care about um, the, the privacy information, another caveat of the system is that you should encrypt over the top. Next slide, please. That would require some device support. So what's out of scope, right? These are uh, application to network interfaces that we're talking about. I'm not talking about um, adding additional support to the device unless the device wants to encrypt over the top. That's, that, uh, that's up to them, but the system will work entirely, will work perfectly fine if it doesn't. Um, the, um, the other thing is that the application has a, a very small number of points of contact for the system to work, Th uh, three, a skim interface. Before a skim interface, you might need to authorize the, app, uh, the, the skim communication itself, right? So that's a little bit more there, a control interface and an MQTT interface. You don't have to go hunting around for the devices, they go find themselves, uh, they, they go make themselves known. Um, this comes back to discovery, by the way, do they make themselves known? 
this if they don't make themselves known then we might have to go hunting for them but that's our problem in the network um and then the interpretation of the data uh, of, of the application data by the network is entirely out of scope next slide please so here's where the the the, the doc the, this this architecture is documented it's documented in drafts and in code um, the, 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 the skim draft is already adopted, so we're pretty much well on our way. It needs more work, um, but we expect that document to head towards um, working group last call um, probably in the spring of next year. Right? It's, it's, it needs more work in, a, in the sense that the English used needs to be repaired a little bit. It needs its security considerations clarified a bit more. Um, and there are some versioning issues that we have to sift through, which we haven't nailed yet. Um, draft Brinkman NIPSI is going to be proposed um, to the ASDF working group as part of the charter expansion. If it doesn't get accepted there, we're also going to be talking to IoT ops um, to figure out what to do. And I'll probably be zeroing in on a couple of area directors saying, where do you want us to, to take this next otherwise? Um, the tie-dye work will be the subject of a hackathon activity tomorrow. Um, and um, so we have a lot of work to do there. Like we, we just released the code uh, last week. Um, and then we found a, a, a couple of, well, problems, shall we say. Um, but the, the, it's on GitHub. We have issues. We have PRs. We're going through the PRs like they're water at the moment because we have a lot of issues. So, um, but that, that code is going to firm up over the next a um, couple of weeks, I think, at least in its base capability. It already supports um, both BLE and Zigbee. I'd like to, if, if I can clean it up enough uh, early tomorrow that we can, you know, I have one or two things to clean up early tomorrow. If that happens, I'm going to start work on, it, on, on FIDO device onboarding, um, which, by the way, Cisco doesn't, you know, from a Cisco standpoint, right, we don't implement FIDO device on, onboarding, but this mechanism could be used even so, right? And we can still make it work in a Cisco network or a Juniper network or whoever's network. The point is that it should be standardized and we use the capabilities of the systems that have been written um, and just uh, dispatch to them uh, as far as skim is concerned. And for uh, BLE, it's a, uh, for, for non-IP, it's a little bit more complex because you don't wanna have to redo the entire AP infrastructure in your, in your ceilings. Questions? Um, just more, mostly from a hackathon point of view, if I wanted to try this out, what BLE like interface would I be using? I mean, I'm used to using D, the DBus interface of Linux here. I'm using web BLE. Like, is, is this any is this implementing any common BLE interface? It, it uses the base um, BLE standard, so. You get GAT reads, GAT writes, um, indications and notifications, and anything on top of that you can have your libraries do, not our business. Doesn't answer my question, but I'll probably get to the hackathon then. Okay. We also brought with us, um, we brought a couple of devices with us, but we also brought a null device uh, with us, a mock device, if you will, so you can tool around with a mock device that just, you know, we have in the gateway. Um, the gateway will run, I, it should run on Raspberry Pis. I made a mistake in that I forgot to turn SSH on my Pis before I left, so I have to go hunting for a display and a keyboard. But um, I'm hoping somebody will help me out there tomorrow. Other questions? Comments? I want to talk about, just for a moment, the relation between this and ASDF. I'll mention this on Monday, too. This is not about modeling. This, this is just about transport, right? You can transport an instance of the model through, through the BLE to non-IP devices, essentially, if, 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 or, or a serialization of the model. You can implement the model on non-IP devices and use this as a transport. So that's the relationship that I envision. But that requires that people want to serialize to um, uh, you know, ASDF onto devices that are non-IP. The other point I wanted to just briefly touch on, um, Karsten, you were talking about um, non-IP use of, of um, co-op. 
it's possible, I suppose, to implement co-op on top of non-IP. I haven't thought about it in, in, in great detail. What I would certainly start with, though, is seeing that these devices um, evolve to use CBOR, at least initially for their encodings, and then worry about the co-op later. Or you could go right to the co-op, but um, I, haven't, I haven't gone to that level. But you should be able to use the, the basic operations here to transport. Um, just hooking into that, um, from what I've, from what you've said about um, notifications and stuff, um, every, uh, co the co-op or get draft should be implementable just this way. So if you have a device that is that exposes co-op or get, and your enterprise system hooks into that, it should just just be able to say, "Yep, get kind of do this." Yeah, if you have a if you that. have a device, if you have like a te a test model device, you should be sitting with us tomorrow. Do you, okay, I don't have the hardware with me, but it's you might. <laughs> okay. Other questions, comments? What do you think? Crazy idea? Good idea? Bad idea? It eases the pain on non-IP. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm uh, recusing myself when whenever somebody says MQTT, so. I, I don't have an opinion on that. Um, I also saw some photograph in that draft. Um, okay, um, but uh, yeah, I think that that is basically a, a pretty good approach to to doing this. And um, I think it's one of those places where you really shouldn't be able to do this in the ITF. I mean. CBO is something we shouldn't have been able to do in the ITF. And, and everybody agreed that this was impossible to do in the ITF. And we did it anyway, and it, it seems to work. And um, this is kind of in, in the same bucket. Um, we shouldn't be doing this in the ITF. But if we have people who show that it actually can be made to work and, and solve business problems and actually strengthen the Internet of Things, as opposed to to uh, shriveling it into thousands of, of pieces. Uh, I think this is a very good thing uh, to do, <clears throat> even if I don't agree with all the, the detailed technology choices. Well, I will say two things about your disagreement, um, which is PR is welcome um, to, to both the draft and to the implementation, uh, mostly to the implementation, because we really want to harden it. The, the, I brought a new guy to the IETF this time who, whose name was on the slide earlier, uh, uh, Rohit Mohan. Rohit has the nasty characteristic of having written the code I want before I finish the sentence in terms of what I want done. <laughs> um, so he's going to be around tomorrow as well. Um, and uh, he got in today. I just I just saw him downstairs in the break. He's jet lagged like crazy. Um, so hopefully he'll survive tomorrow. The, the other observation I would like to make is how do we actually funnel this into the IETF? And um, I think that, that your idea of uh, using the ASDF working group for this is uh, quite innovative. Um, so far, ASDF has focused on modeling only, has not been doing um, any uh, I don't want to use the term transport, any, any way of moving things around. It's just a static model of things. And uh, we haven't even finished our protocol bindings work. So I think you, you are building the, the other side of, of the bridge. <laughs> and uh, we probably still need to build the bridge at some point in time. But uh, uh, I, I actually think this, uh, would work with a pragmatic approach of, of doing the this red star process where we have different ecosystems and we just try to find the common uh, parts of this and, and build something around the common parts. Yeah, and, and you know, from my perspective, I expect that an ocean is going to be in this, right? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll figure a way to do an ocean. We'll figure a way to do um, LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN is a little different. Um, Big difference with LoRaWAN is that it's not, um, it, it wasn't really envisioned to be indoor. 
It also has different frequencies and modulations. It, it's not just a frequency and module. It's not just a modulation thing. It's, it's frequencies as well. And so um, you probably do need the dongles. But even with the dongles, you can still use this model as long as the DAP does the right thing with that. One of the other things I wanted to say is there's another game going on in this space, which is everybody, I mentioned it briefly, everybody has their app that they want to run on the AP. That becomes a nightmare for the administrator. So the more we can pull back to the application um, edge of the network, the easier it will be for implementing applications. That's the thing that I think is most important. The, this race to, to have either parallel infrastructure, either in hardware or in software, is, uh, is going to turn out to be a customer, from a Cisco perspective and an end deployment from an everybody else perspective, nightmare. So we, we have one of the, the experts on LoRa in the room. So Laura, what's your take on this? You, you need to switch on your microphone. Okay. Um, for me, the, the more difficult thing with LoRa is really the duty cycle. Uh, and the fact that when you, when you concentrate traffic and, and access point, then you, the duty cycle goes also to your, uh, to your access point. So it means that you, you have to be very careful with acknowledgement and this stuff. That can create a lot of problems. So, in co in uh, in co-op, we have the no response, the no no response uh, option that can be very useful for for that. And after that, I think it's we we can carry things. I think that makes a really strong argument for a pub sub approach. Actually, you know, in terms of the 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 um, application edge, because you just if you publish and don't get a response, well, you weren't expecting one. Yes, that's, that's the way. If, in fact, you, you need to have negative acknowledgement more than positive acknowledgement. Um, first, one logistic uh, request. Can you sign up on me the code that we get your names on the blue list? Um, sorry, blue sheet. Then, um, Elliot, um, for more discussion on, on the NIPSI, um, you mentioned that it's going to be, I guess, very briefly presented at, at the ASDF. For more detailed, in-depth discussions, what would be the right? We for, haven't um, established a mailing list for this yet, so I think maybe the next step is to, and, and this may be a topic at, uh, you know, either at, at uh, ASDF or maybe just with um, Francesca, and say, hey, can we have a, a mailing list to discuss this, or can we use the ASDF mailing list if the chairs are okay with that? I don't want to, you know, obviously the, the charter of ASDF and the other work of the ASDF has to take priority at the moment. And I don't want to overwhelm the group with things that are not within the charter for sure. So um, we could start with a mailing list, but then maybe move to wherever it is we move to as as time goes on. I, we haven't gone that far. We're literally just going to present the draft this week. Yeah, I think it would be good to get the non-working group meeting list set up very quickly. Okay, I'll talk to Francesca about it. Yeah, so they, they, they have a form you have to fill in. You probably best have that form ready. So if you Google for non-working group mailing lists on the ITF side, you find that form and, and just fill that in and send that <coughs> to Francesca. Okay, thank you. And um, have you considered a site meeting this week? Yeah, indeed. Um, I think we're gonna try and set that up um, starting on the, at the hackathon, um, we haven't set a time, but I think what we'll do is, um, if, if you're going to, will you be at ASDF? So I'll be at the ASDF. I'll, I'm leaving on Thursday. So if it's before right, Thursday. Right. So I, I think a lot of people are. So I think probably we'll, we'll, we'll try and set something up for Tuesday is my guess, either Tuesday or, or, uh, either Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday morning, I think is, is where we're likely to land for that. Maybe even Wednesday afternoon. I don't know. We'll have to look and see what the calendar looks like. But um, stop by the hackathon and we'll sort that because I think it's probably a good idea to have that. And then you can also meet, um, you'll meet um, some of the people who are actually more important on this project than I am. You, you got the dregs today. Thanks.
So we have at least onion routing, uh, one of the other topics that we have. Well, we have actually a good, good amount of time left uh, if, if we want to run until 6 p.m., that is, of course. <laughs> um, but maybe it's a quick agenda bash. Uh, what, what are all the topics we still want to cover? I see onion, onion and, and get and the naming, the ones you have, Krish. Um, yeah, on, so for, for me, for me, it's 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 onion co-op and on the naming thing, and given the non-IP stuff that has come up, I might be sharing one or two old slides on the topic of co-op over gut just to just just to get that uh, to get that spread a bit. Where is it here? Yeah, wrong slide set. Ah. Uh, Okay, so I would stop sharing slides and you can generate yours. But I guess I'll start with the with the onion co-op and then go from there to the naming. I think that's the more logical. Okay, um, so this is uh, this is a draft that has been uh, split out from work on proxy capable uh, from from OSCO capable proxies, and this is really I mean, this, we there are no no full like there there are no in full requirements or applications that necessarily need this, but it's a, a nice exercise that we've started um, around um, around uh, OSCO. And I think it could be valuable, especially when it comes to um, interactions with IoT devices where the devices don't want to reveal their network location. So the, the gist of all this, can, can I? This might make, might, might make sense for <clears throat> remote participants. Um, the gist of all this is that a lot of the building blocks that allow Tor to work um, are already in Co-op, given that we have OSCore with proxy support and ad hoc, there are sure a few bits that are missing, but like the the, the basics are there. Um, so this takes like the the whole security stack of of OSCore, uh, of uh, Co-op, OSCore, and ad hoc, um, and then uh, Marco has started work on allowing. OSCOR to traverse through proxies, which means basically that there is an OSCOR connection from the from say the client to a proxy, uh, where the client is authenticated to the proxy and thus is allowed to talk to the some server, and then the client still sets up an end-to-end OSCOR connection, usually through ad hoc, um, with that uh, with that origin server. There are a few pieces of transport indication in there when it comes to a server announcing its services at uh, at the location of a proxy and um i'll come back to the naming and there is um and we don't have all the building blocks here yet for setting up the reverse proxies but i think they can they can grow out of this document um so how does how does this look like it looks basically like so if you're familiar with tor the onion routing there you have um hidden services that have a cryptographic identifier and then use a network of multiple hops to hide their actual location. Um, they establish tunnels with each of them in, se in sequence, and then the client does the same thing in the other direction. Um, we can do the same with co-op, but without using some, some extra network overlay. So we can just use plain, ad ho uh, plain OSCore to encrypt the individual hops. If we have a bunch of proxies, say here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, that are all publicly available and that are willing to connect to other of the, to, to others of these proxies. Um, the in as as with Tor, the um, the the endpoints pick a sequence of proxies they want to hide behind if they want to act as a hidden client or as a hidden service, and the length of that sequence. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll come. Yeah, the length of that that sequence may easily be zero, um, and especially for this. Given that we are not building an overlay network, but just um, using using co-op as a mechanism, if neither of those wants to use anything special, they just do plain co-op or plain plain ad hoc. Um, but if they pick such a chain, for example, the server picks five, seven, two, and four, where four is the address it publicly announces, 
it create, first creates a secure connection with proxy five, where secure means that it authenticates that proxy five is indeed on the list of proxies that we don't really fully trust, but that we don't know at least enough of that if we pick several of them in sequence, um, chances are that none of them will, that, that not all of, that they won't cooperate to track our traffic. Um, while we're creating those connections, those servers between each other are also set up ad hoc connections. Um, and then the server connects to um, proxy seven and connects to proxies two. By connect here always means establishes security context with and also instructs them to act as a reverse proxy for them. So in the end, uh, proxy four is set up as a reverse proxy for, for our server. And when a request comes in there, it is sent through those um, proxies two, seven, and five, and eventually um, processed by the server. In the other direction, once those services are announced, the client builds up, su builds up such a chain of its own. In this case, it doesn't need to set up the proxies permanently as reverse proxies, but it can just use the um, uh, the, uh, the, the OSCO capable proxies um, basically source routing style um, root information to pass that on. There might be optimizations later we could do uh, to make that more persistent, but in theory, this can be as stateless as establishing a security context can be stateless. And now each of these proxies um, just sees a very small part of the picture. Proxies three and five um, see that those particular individuals are talking with them because they know their network addresses but the traffic they see is heavily hidden behind layers of encryption. Whereas proxy four does see the end, the end-to-end the -end communication, but it is separated by several steps from the original addresses and can does not know who is talking to whom. And ad hoc and OSCore hopefully make sure that the information that is visible to P4 is actually um, not nothing valuable. So I've touched on on names a few times, and this is what this is part of what the uh, what the draft assumes to be there, and especially it's in the the bucket of things that are assumed to be there and are not fully specified out yet. Um, that is that we have some names that are based on cryptographic identifiers. Um, the way I'm um, describing them is as as CCS is a SIBO claim set um, that would form some kind of name. Um, but generally, this draft is, is in a very early stage. So this is showing that it illustrate more, more illustrating than showing that it can be done and collecting uh, ways to go to go forward with this. Um, so as to, to, to make progress on this, one thing is, and that Marco has been very helpful in doing this, is starting to compare this um, component by component with Tor. Uh, also looking at what security properties does Tor provide? What security properties can we provide even to the smallest of devices? And going forward from that, I'd like to start um, this as an experiment and just operate a network of a few a few nodes and a few operators and see whether this can whether this can actually work and whether this is useful, for example, for for small web applications where people want to use them from constrained devices. And if we look briefly back to where's that slide five. <clears throat> There's a lot of encrypted connections going on, but each of the participant, uh, each of the end devices, only establishes as many as it deems useful. And if the server decides to hide behind a five deep net layer of networks, that there's a complexity that the server has to manage, but the client still needs to manage only the num basically the up to up to as many uh, ad hoc and OSCO contexts as it requires depth. Um, for its own location, and if it decides not to hide its location or just hide behind one proxy, then one that is. And each of that state is like a, in the order of magnitude of 100 bytes or so. So nothing, nothing terribly huge. Yep, um, I think that's it for me. Yeah, final question, um, is T2TRG really the place to do this? I don't know, it seems to make sense, but that's for you. You probably need some some uh, collaborators to to run this experiment. Yes. So that's any maybe... any students and the more 
send them away. <laughs> so this is um, something that, that the research group could be useful for, for setting up this network of uh, collaborators. And uh, we also probably want to generate uh, um, an outcome, which is uh, probably a little bit like uh, the outcome of the DT energy, which is uh, just a set of specifications that together tell you how to do this. And uh, then we probably want to generate a couple of papers that, that go to conferences and, and uh, explain what, what we have measured here. Um, so we would have to, to run a little bit of measurements in, in that yeah. experiment. With, with that, I think the, the answer is yes, uh, but of course you do need those collaborators and you need do need those uh, academic conferences to, to publish the results to somebody who, who writes the paper. Sounds good to me. So you probably need to develop a, a, a story of why uh, your coffee machine wants to do onion routing. Yes. Mm. Uh, and but fr frankly, this doesn't necessarily need to be the, the classical IP um, sensor, sensor and actuator devices. Um, so for example, the, um, there has been a bit of interest in, in using small devices, not because they are like, because we can produce many of them, but because you can, um, you can get much higher level of confidence in their, in their design. For example, the, the uh, precursor, um, precursor be trusted uh, devices where you have devices that are really small in their computational cap capability, probably like class two devices, but um, in a shape that is similar to, to PDA and built in such a way that you can inspect the whole thing and trust that it really does what it is advertised to do. So this we, the story might not be the, the classical fridge. So this will all be bit Bitcoin wallets. Uh... <laughs> I wouldn't put those there, but it is the kind of device where you could reasonably um, put a Bitcoin wallet if you are so inclined. Okay, can we um, dwell on this naming thing for a moment? Um, so you said you need something like RD Link to manage those names, or? Um, <clears throat> so our D link is our D link is basically where is is basically where I put the my my original thoughts on on using CCS names um, and advertising them. Um, I think and if if this were done now, this would be rather split into the cryptographic names part and the advertising part and the advertising part is probably mostly relevant to to this onion style uh, onion style thing because you are in a in a more decentralized environment um, there there would um, in, in order for this to work there will need to be some directory reasonably uh, a distributed directory possibly DHD based um, in which any um, any device such as this server one can publish that the that an entry point at which this particular hidden service can be reached would be this server P4. That would be a signed statement, a statement signed with that key that indicates the address, or at least um, a statement that um, it, it might it might suffice, and there is some text in the latest version of transport indication. It might suffice to not sign that information, but just state the information and verify it in the early stages of the ad hoc exchange. Right, and th that has all the usual problems of, of somebody messing with discovery and uh, yes. causing things to expand effort. Yes, but um, I think it was worth pointing out here that the proxies are not expected to be constraint devices. Right. It will just be, it should just be relatively easy for any reasonably sized device to handle a lot of connections because they are designed to be handleable by small devices. 
Okay, on the chat we have an indication that Jiran also believes that think thing research group is the right place to do this. Um, so I think we we have some some interest in this and um, yeah, cryptographically generated names is probably a sub problem that we can yeah. isolate nicely and uh, make uh, make that generally uh, useful. Yes. <clears throat> and the, the structure of, of uh, CCS or CWT to actually indicate that there is a Indian router reachable server at something that's also something we would standardize. So, sorry, please, please, please raise again. I was briefly so distracted by the chat. How, how do you say that th there is a, a what claims in CCS besides CNF? What else than ROC, RPK, RPK? I think it's essentially like C C C CCS is just the, the, the one way that I also can put a public, raw public key into a network exchange. So I don't expect any claims in there other than the raw so, public key. So it's just a packaged CNF? Claim, or... Yes. There might be um, so there, there there might be uh, there might be use cases for especially when when you're um, setting up multiple devices um, to have um, to have actual um, to to have um, larger tokens in there if you for example do something like um, set up a name hierarchy under a cryptographic identifier but I, I'd place that in the area of future work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, maybe we should actually have a separate document for for this usage of, of CCS. Um, separate from the naming, or just separate mm -hmm. from this? I don't know. Um, so I mean, onion routing is is um, a specific application of this, but it probably has some some use outside. Onion routing. Story. I mean, for for, for 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 example, this is something with, that can be relevant in 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 for Coop or GAT, because you find a device, you get a MAC address, or you don't even get the MAC address because your environment doesn't let you access the MAC address, and the cryptographic identifier will both give you an identifiable, look at a long-term usable um, address for this thing, and also help bootstrap secure communication. So this is definitely useful yeah. outside of onion routing. The question was, is there any kind of where you're hinting at just doing name, the cryptographic names outside or splitting even up the cryptographic names from the um, RPK in uh, CCS just, just no, using I the RPK? No, I don't think that okay. needs okay. to be split up. Okay. Good. Well, we are seeing some interest also from Jörn. Maybe one quick question on the on the overhead. Probably this is gonna be part of the experiments you were running. But um, what's kind of you mentioned? It's some hundreds of bytes of, of state uh, per proxy. But then what about on the wire? <clears throat> so on the wire, um, let's 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 tackle the the responses first because they are the, the the easier to describe. On the responses, I expect basically the the eleven ish bytes that that um, that Oscor adds. Um, to responses per layer, although it might easily make sense for some of those connections that are not the initial and the, and the end-to-end -end connections uh, to use shortened tags. So this is out of this is not feasible with a SCCM, but for example, SCON um, is planning to standard uh, is planning to um, file like four byte tags, something like that, um, that are more like that are useful in this context because if this four, if someone can forge the, the four byte or even two byte tag, um, it just allows them to forward that message one layer further. And unless they then also hit the next two byte tag, that message gets dropped there. Um, so that can get us down to say five to six bytes on the wire and responses per, um, per layer. 
on the request side, this will heavily depend on whether we establish a mechanism for setting up um, proxy forwardings in a stateful way. So um, right now, when the client here in line here in the, the connection of 10 sets up the connection to P3, it will use that uh, that ad hoc con uh, that OSCO context to send a request that then carries a URI dash host containing the cryptographic identifier of P6 so that the P3 can connect to P6, verify that it's P6, and forward this. This would add like 30 bytes plus um, per request. If this can be set up in a stateful way, then we are talking about um, it's a bit more than 11, it's like 16 bytes per layer um, ballpark. Yep, thanks. And I'm, I'm probably missed some acronyms in your explanation, so maybe you want to check that um, out. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Sorry. But anyway, that, that was good ballpark. Thanks. Oh, and if chic is used in addition, um, it's possible to make it work even if we are applying multiple score layers in a tunnel way. So you can, in principle, yes, you can, in principle, perform that sort of compression on each distinct layer. And there are already some, well, more than notes about this in the core document. Uh, because it can be applicable in general, but especially when applied here, where you have not more than two that I imagine to be the main cases, but, but an arbitrary number of nested layers. Uh, of course, that requires to establish compression rules, which is a separate topic and happen statically or, or in band, mm -hmm. possibly when running ad hoc, whatever. Yes, sounds indeed researchy, so. <laughs> and and when we think about right. obfuscation and tunneling, when then multiple OSCOR layers are there, you could even like obfuscate the original addresses if they still are there. So because only the endpoints know about, yeah. That's really interesting, sorry. <laughs> By the way, Laurent, do you have any slides you want to show on, on the key thing? What What's his name? What the I, I can present I, I saw the title of my presentation so I can try to do something that looks in uh, like the title. I have some presentation about uh, PyConf and uh, CopConf yes. and yes. the yes. extension. Can, yeah. can you submit the slides to? Uh, uh, after can I share my screen now and I, I will send this we can because it's well. part of a large presentation. Yeah, I just just wanted to get, to get you to submit the slides if you want to do that. But if you share the screen, that's fine. Yeah. We just want to have the slides afterwards. Okay, no problem. So we have one thing that is called naming things. Sure. You see my screen here? I was wondering whether we should do the naming things thing first because it's the right direct segue on, on what we just discussed and then you. Yes, but if we do the naming things, then. Um... Okay. Um. If okay. okay. Um. If if Al, if Elliot is back, I would I would add two slides of um co-op over get in there, and that those I would just still, that, those I still have to submit. So depends on how strict you are on this. Okay. Thing. To me, is this any of that? Yeah. But having two slides about uh, get is probably useful for most of us. <laughs> okay, I just completely lost track of my windows, so if it's okay with you, I'll submit Welcome them. Welcome to the club. <laughs> um, um, but if I'm if I'm to show something, then I'll have to be granted. Some rights again. Um. Ah, it takes a moment. So who, who has the token right now? 
Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is just um, look go, going back re, re, reusing a few reusing a few slides. Uh, the point of co-op over get originally is to um, give users in an environment with a very exotic constraint a way out. Uh, the exotic constraint is that their device does have all the hardware to use BLE. And it would, um, if the user could run arbitrary software on their device, be perfectly capable of doing what's here in the middle, what is, I think, the encouraged way of doing um, co-op over BLE. That is, run BLE, uh, use LT L2 cap with the six low pan profile for BLE, that is the IPSB profile. On top of that, you have IPv6, and then we can run co-op over UDP as it was intended. Um, unfortunately, um, operating systems don't real, especially mobile operating systems, don't really make this easy. Um, so there is either the option, as the Golden Gate project does it, to take the what can be used easily, that is the the co-op GAT um, protocol. Ah, sorry, the the BLE GAT protocol to establish a link layer on top of that and run IPv6 over that and run co-op over UDP on top of that, which is um, perfectly feasible, but which has two downsides, one of them being that there is a lot of um, retransmission opportunities missed because GAT has some form of has some forms of reliability which are then re-implemented on top of it. And the other is that the application suddenly has to ship an IP stack. And uh, this can easily be a bit excessive. So what I'm um, suggesting here is, and have described and implemented, although not in the very latest doc, uh, draft form, um, is co-op directly over GAT, where the, the GAT um, profile of BLE is being used to transport requests and responses, and um, the capability of a device to run COBOL over GAT is advertised in the, in, the, uh, in the BLE advertisements. And this not only works from any mobile operating system, but even runs from web browsers that support the web Bluetooth extension which sadly, as of now, is just Chrome or Chrome-based browsers, which is everything but Firefox. Um, but fortunately, the Mozilla community that has originally stated that this is uh, uh, that the web Bluetooth extension is considered being considered insecure now has ways of dealing with extensions that they consider insecure in such a way that they can still be made available to some to some sites. And I hope that as they are reconsidering their positions. Uh, this can be part of of the set of APIs that are allowed. Um, the messages um, over GAT look rather similar to UDP in the sense that they still have or they have some similarity to UDP in that they have a token length and a code and token. You say similar to, to UDP. Sorry, mean... similarity to co-op over UDP. Okay. Um, but the rest of the header looks vastly different because unlike UDP, this is an order system. Unlike UDP, this has options for reliable trans um, transmission. So the whole reliable, unreliable um, message ID um, part can be compressed down to a nibble uh, using something like a one-bit message ID. And um, that suffices to get both reliable and unreliable transmission and non-traditional responses such as observation or multiple responses to proxy requests to proxy requests that in the end uh, wind up in a multicast scenario um, through the protocol and it can be used in both directions. So the co-op, uh, the, the BLE uh, device and the BLE central, uh, the peripheral, which is typically some hardware device and the central, which is typically your cell phone, can both either take the role of a co-op server or the co-op client at the same time. Yeah, this is, um, I think this is just a screenshot of how this looks when used from a web browser. Uh, the current demo is much more pretty, is, is much prettier and also already also runs um, ACE and OSCore and the ACE OSCore profile. Um, yep, and that's almost it. And I'll skip that slide because the addressing stuff is a bit in flux and that's for the naming part. And the slides are on record already. They are from the ITF 116. And I can upload them later. 
So um, if there are no direct pending questions here, I would go over to the naming topic. So uh, naming things. Uh, naming things is known to be one of the three hard um, problem, uh, two hard, three hard, I always mix them up, um, in computer sciences. Um, but fortunately, in in co-op and, and other ITF work, uh, we do have those um, fancy things called URIs. And so far in co-op, we've identified all resources with them. And that's a pattern that I think makes sense, so let's stick with that. Um, I'll be talking about placing about using more exotic names in the uh, in the authority component that doesn't mean that there are not options to do completely different things um, and I'm happy to talk about them but I didn't prepare anything because I don't think there are good options there so if you do um yeah let's let's do that later um, let's look at what a URI typically um, typically does for the user. It, um, and uh, you don't see uh, the highlighting. It get, some of the highlighting gets lost, but you, you can probably see anyway. Um, so it tells us um, how to reach the service, so which protocol to pick, HTTPS in the, in the web browser example. It tells us how to get there, because it encodes a name, and that name is resolved through an arbitrary um, resolution system as preferred by the operating system, and hopefully they all operate, and they all do, because they're all DNS. Um, so that that gives us a, um, an, an address where to reach the, um, the advertised system. It also tells us how to establish a secure connection with them if there is a pattern established. So in the web browser, that is the PKI. Um, that is something we cannot take for granted. And yeah, and it provides an identity. So if we see two different, if we see the same URI in two different places, we can uh, infer some things about them. So for example, if a URI has been accessed in a particular location, if a resource has been dereferenced, then we may have a cache representation of that resource. But this is not always that simple. So um, HTTP has now become uh, three protocols or three transports for, for the same protocol. Um, some some kinds of addresses uh, intentionally do not resolve to an IP address. So I'm tried not to always do Onion as an example here. Um, the I2P project, the Invisible Internet project, um, does something similar to Tor in the sense that they also provide a, a, net, um, a network that goes through an anonymization, an anonymization chain. And um, I2P, wiki.i2p um, cannot be resolved in, in DNS. And still, it is a usable website. Uh, it's a usable web address if you have a browser that knows what to do with it or just goes through a proxy that knows what to do with it. <coughs> Sorry. Um, verifying the, um, the, the peer also comes with challenges. So you don't get um, certificates issued for IP addresses, and um, especially not for IP, uh, ULA addresses. And the same address, uh, same URI also doesn't always mean the same thing. So if um, link local addresses, um, local host, all those are just, um, yeah. There, there, the, the U is just uniform in URI. It's not universal or, or otherwise um, globally reachable. Um, knowing this, we can look at what co-op can do to just opt out of a few of those um, properties because it doesn't make sense. So for example, um, the slip marks, um, that is co-op over UARTs, uh, just uses um, device names over um, as authorities. And that works out because it's only used locally. Of course, um, you can't take that address, interpret it on a different system, and expect it to do the same. But so uh, that's already true for any uh, linked local address that contains a zone identifier. There's some trust implied because there is a wire, and wires are always good for trust. But um, it doesn't help much with the cryptographic identity. Coop over GAT um, in the latest version has a very has a, a scheme that is using that uh, the .r persona for something that just like I2P doesn't resolve to an IP address, 
but can be used to infer the how and the where and also we'll even work on as an identity provided that we assume that the MAC addresses don't collide, which they usually do. Uh, the next example is from the RD link document that I've mentioned earlier and this um, base 32 probably uh, string is encoding for a very short um, uh, CBO claim <coughs> set with the AB just basically being part of this. Um, and this would provide the identity, uh, and this would provide a means of setting up an encrypted um, a security context with that resource without providing the where. But then again, uh, a protocol such as RDLink or, or the onion routing, where you publish addresses and then establish a secure connection with, what, um, with the service that is beh behind them, even though it's not physically located at that address, in, in that case, that's suitable. And uh, using the the mechanism of, of protocol indication that can even allow some give us some leeway with respect to the protocol in front of here so we don't we can use co-op without some plus indicating another transport because we already get additional information about how to reach that service um, we are already reaching it through a proxy so it doesn't really matter um, what we put there and we can just as well put the easiest thing we have in there um, as a, on a more general note, um, the, the, the how doesn't matter for co-op too much because as soon as you, ha you have a, say, default proxy, you don't have to care about the details of, of the scheme as much anymore. Yep, um, and that's everything that I've prepared for here because I think that naming is more a topic for larger discussion than, than for an individual presentation, so that's all I have. Can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Yeah, so um, TTY USB zero is um, a local identifier. The other identifiers are um, can have global semantics. So that, that's maybe one thing that uh, we want to differentiate. Yeah, that's that's the identity. If it has global semantics, you can use it as an identity. If not, yeah, but can we actually maybe transform the the dual case into a global identifier? Um, yes. So if if the if the device, I mean if. If, if the device behind there, for example, advertises another name and then advertises this just as a proxy address, it can well do that. And it can, for example, advertise that behind this address, um, that this address is just a proxy for co-op NB something something hex AB RD link ARPA, or however we wind up calling it. And then that, uh, that global identifier will be the name that is used by the application. And the other is just a trend basically just the name of the proxy that we're using to, to get there. Yeah, I was just thinking about the um, use case that Elliot has and uh, maybe his access point actually has some components <laughs> that need to be talked to over a UART interface. Yes, and... nice. Very yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. <clears throat> it's a weird dongle, but it's still a dongle. So would we actually register these scheme names, coap plus UART and coap plus get? Um, the thing is, we have to we we have to provide rules for mapping. So every transport we have has to provide rules that allow mapping the the. So even if we don't use a global identifier, we'll have to be able to construct some name um, for the transport for for the for the for the resource identified by the by the otherwise unnamed request. Um, would, 
with Slipmux, certainly the thing on the other end of the wire doesn't care that it was TTY USB zero on, on the. Uh, it doesn't course. care, but if the if the application feeds the the, the, the application, may, so as long as the application uses a high level identifier and the co op stack does all the discovery, that's easy. But if the application somehow um, needs to talk to that particular device, it will need to send. It will need the ability to talk to TTY USB zero something. Um, if we decided on some namespace and for the USB zero, that the, the new dot alt might make just as much sense as dot arpa. Um, yes, that could work. Would work for co-op. Well, maybe this ties in with the discussion we had in the break about the, the co-op uh, APIs that we have and uh, how we actually hand down resource identifiers there. Yes, um, but we, the, the, there is probably a case to do the low-level access in all um, e even with the best of APIs. And so th think of it, think of it as, as accessing it through proxy. So if 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 you have a if you have a device that has say a Bluetooth low energy and UART and and stuff, and you're accessing the the, the co-op um, co-op peers connected through all of these through the device acting as a proxy, then you would send a request for yeah if if it says TTY, TTY USB zero dot Slip dot alp that can only resolve to co-op over UART. Yep, it, you might manage to do away with it. The, the, what, what still irks me is we needed it for co-op over TCP. So why do, and we will still need it for co-op over TCP at least to in order to be able to name it. But that's probably because the names we are encoding in DNS do not carry transport information. And they don't carry ports, so we are lagging the ports around. Unless yeah. we're using SRV records, but we are not using them, so yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say SVCP. Yeah. Oh, I, I still have an, an open check uh, out to Adam Roach, uh, whom I promised when, when we actually registered Coab plus TCP. We were going to find a way to generalize this. Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is what, what transport indication is doing. And transport indication allows you to do something like address it as co-op colon slash slash some, um, something something or link ARPA, even though the actually chosen transport is co-op over TCP. Um, the, the line of thought I've been using so far is that those plus schemes we can still have them, but we use them to indicate the low, lower layers. Um, even though on the on the practical on the practical side we might use co-op like playing co-op colon slash slash more and more. Yeah, I think we, we need to write that one up. So, so let's co plus AT for a while. Yeah. But AT is just a catch-all that's not like co-op plus AT is not any, adding anything at all. No. Um, so what I've been wondering a bit is, and, and, and that ties into the BLE is um, when people, when, when so, so the way we are thinking about this here is mostly in a in a non DNS um, setting. But if people start using it in a DNS setting, so for example, if someone decided to create a BLE a BLE resource record, so that some name could resolve to a BLE MAC that would then be addressed through Elliot's um, um, the network finds it for you, which would be perfectly reasonable actually. Yeah, then, then you still don't need the core plus get because the th you know that you're getting back a you, you're getting back a record for a BLE address, and the only reason why the why we need core plus TCP is because the, the A and quad A records are the weird ones out that don't tell you what to do on, further with it. Yeah. Like DNS is skip in, in a sense DNS is skipping a is skipping a layer. Yeah, it's it's no. handing out the layer three addresses without when it actually might 
hand out their four addresses, but that is only being done by SRV records, which in a sense, which in a sense are the thing that we could also have used for TCP. So if we can actually abstract away DNS a little bit here, because uh, that, <laughs> that may not be the best way to run this uh, mapping. Um, but I think that the basic idea of having something that, that collects information, like, like an SRV record, um, that, that's still applicable even if it's not DNS uh, yep. encoded. So maybe after CRI, we need something on that level as well. Um, I don't think, I think CRIs should, should suffice here if we are like, if we're making good use of those dot pro style names. Right. The, the reason why I'm mentioning CRIs is, is that um, you're not mentioning security on this slide at all. Um, I do. Um, so the, the only of, of all those three items, the third item is the one that also provides a, a trust. The others don't. Yeah. The, the, gives me identity of, of the thing on the other side, but it's not really helping me how how should I establish a security relationship, a security association with that end. I mean, I have a key, but nobody tells me what to do with that key. The implicit assumption we're always using Oscar to do that. Um, Mine is. <laughs> okay. Or oh, ad hoc, more specifically, because the CWT can only be, you know, uh, CCS can only be used with that. Although, if the credit, like, um, if it, it's it's perfectly, um, it 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 would be perfectly um, thinkable to have in to have a similar name that is not like the the AB dot RD link is kind of in encoding here that this is something that is usable in an asymmetric way because that's what the registries envisioned back then would have said. Um, there could just as well be an, a tree under which you can have, say, um, ACE OSCO profile tokens, although they are really narrow scope because they don't, because they are usable only by a, by a single endpoint because any other endpoint would get a completely different token. Um, in the end, I think it's the it's the shape of the token that influences what you can do, provided that all you have is the token. So how do you know where, where to get this token? Um, that, that 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 is in there. So the the the, the um, base thirty two encoded thing is a CCS. Ah, okay. okay. Or the the precursor to that, because the term I think I'm not sure whether the term was really. No, I'd use then. Okay. Well, I think the the main issue that, that I have is that it's not that clear when we can put the transport information in the authority and when we have to encode part of it in, in the thing. Yeah. But I, I'm, 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 from from the discussion, I'm more and more leaning toward we can probably do slip mux and curb over get with just the the with just the RPO identifiers back there and no new schemes. And then those RPO identifiers would behave in the same way as I, raw IP literals. Um, behave in curb over UDP because curb over UDP takes the peer's IP address and codes it in an IP literal, and those are just different, just just the canonical encoding for those MAC addresses or device names. Yeah, makes me wonder whether we'll ever use the IP view future version of of um, RFC three nine eight six. You know that that this is currently being discussed. Not. No, really. Um... <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 as as much as I'd love it, we haven't really like. 
reached full adoption of IPv6. So like, you know, not, not uh, to actually do a new IP version, but to do an old IP version, which is IPv6. And uh, add a zone identifier to that because the percent syntax is, is kind of ugly. Funny. No, it's, it's bad. Uh, and uh, we're currently looking for ways to, to go beyond that. And interestingly, the, the IP printing protocol actually has uh, a syntax which is v1. Dot, and you get the IPv6 address and uh, then uh, the, the zone identifier in, in some form, I forget. I've seen those. Yeah, and uh, these things are standardized and they would go through every UI parser that's uh, worth the salt. That's a bold statement. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, so, um, yes, so emulating a DNS name is, is certainly one way to, to get through URI parsers, emulating an IPv future uh, name would be another mm -hmm. way, and we probably should be watching the, the discussion on six men, I think it's on six men about what to do with the um, percent character that nobody likes. Good, I think we have raised enough questions. <laughs> <laughs> and another book. Yeah. Thank you very much for preparing this. Could it be CCS with X5T? Yes. So this is um, basically everything that is in 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 RD link. Um, I didn't look so in in RD link. I didn't um, talk about CCSs yet, but I really took the um, onion more onion niche approach of encoding of just encoding the raw public key, the, the the public key in the URI, and then having the information that is in the CCS that is not the public key itself in this dot ab part um this will need to be revisited and they will need a concrete proposal and there is currently no concrete proposal but any i think that any token that can be used without additional information um and cc ccs and x5t are definitely in in that set um should be usable just means that there may need to be a bit more indication uh, during the ad hoc handshake as to like what the client accepts of the server to present as to to to, to use as the as the ID cred R and the cred R. But that's manageable. Thanks. Okay. Um... So, is that all we have on naming? Best of our knowledge, yes. So, in, in that case, I would like to ask Laurent to yeah. present his thing, which is again in the self description bucket to a certain extent. Okay. Share slide, this one. Share screen. Okay, I'm not sure it works. <laughs> so is your... Are your slides submitted somewhere? Um, I, I have them, but I can send you if you want. Please because do. I cannot uh, put them directly in, uh, in the GitHub. I have to think. Um, so, Carsten.
sorry, I wake up at four in the morning and nice. almost, <laughs> <laughs> almost I jack an airplane to, to come. <laughs> Okay, I send you by mail, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. I okay, I have to I have to accept. Okay, maybe I can share them now. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, normally, if it works, you don't have it? It looks like you shared the window with the screen. Yeah. Okay, so did you get to them? No. no it has to go from france to germany <laughs> and then to prague yeah. for the past it is proposed that on the uh in the new right yes and it will go direct on the internet i'm sure but i think it's like one two three four six seven eight nine so i don't know <laughs> well i just ping 1.1 1 .1 on on that ethernet <laughs> cable and it gave me a, a RTT of 873 microseconds. So, well, I'm going to go to this address of that in the tab. You can post your slides there. Uh, okay. Put it there. Put okay, okay, fine. All slides, mm. I can approve them, and then they will appear on the other side. Okay. I'm in the slide manager. Okay. So what's it called? Pyong. It's in there, yes, Pyong and Yep, yeah, got it. Okay. So you should be able to select it now. Oh, I could. I can share. Hmm? Are you sharing them or is that? I thought that Laura okay. was sharing them. Oh, yeah. uh, up to you. Now it's here. Ask to share slide. Okay, and I have to find them. <laughs> this phone isn't exactly optimized yet. <laughs> no, uh, okay, so I think this one sent yes. a big complaint okay. mail. That's the naming. Oh, well, right. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so this is some something that comes from what we we did with uh, with Chic. So we we create a young data model for the Chic rules, and uh, so you have some we have some hierarchy of rules. So we. We have several rules that are identified by two keys on inside the compression rules, and we have all the fields that are also identified by uh, by three keys. So in in the slide, you see the the keys uh, of the young data model represented by uh, with a star at at the beginning. So it means that uh, when you want you have some uh, you have a structure that is conform with the, to this uh, young data model when you want to find something in fact what you have to go is to to cross this young data model to find the the seed the, the information you you want so at each level you you have different set of keys so at at the first level we have the rule and the rule length and we have the field position etc etc and at the end, we have some uh, index to, to get the value. So for the moment, this information is stored nowhere. 
So it means that you, you have to program it, but you, you don't know uh, if you just have a seed list, how to, to get to that information. So what we, we have done, so maybe it's in, on this slide, is that when we browse the, the young data model, we create a structure that is called here key mapping. And this key mapping contains all the seed of all the list you have in the young data model. So it's this uh, value uh, between codes. And inside, then you have uh, an array. And this array contains the seeds of the keys. So this way, for example, at the first level, you know that you have to, uh, to read two values to uh, to match to be sure that you it worked well. For example, if I go come back here, uh, I know that to to find which uh, element, which subtree I have to cross, I have to find rule ID equal R and rule length equal L. So this R on L are sent in in the request. At the, so then. We have to cross the second level. And here we know that we have to look at three elements. And so that's what is its store on this. And when you have this structure, you can apply the same algorithm to any young data model. So you don't have to, to know your uh, young data model. You directly apply something that is very uh, agnostic of what you, you are sending. So what we, we are doing right now is to, to implement this in, uh, in Python and C. And it means that the user just has to, uh, to define a young data model. And then we have uh, automated tools that allow us to browse on, uh, on it to find an information. And the only thing we, we are really to need to program is the leaves and to make an association between a, a, a seed and a function that will give the value or write the value for, for this seed. So it's uh, something we find uh, very, very useful. And it's implemented in uh, uh, a fork of, uh, of Pionk that is in my uh, GitHub repo. And you have a seed extension that allow you to generate uh, this part. Seed extension also allows you to add another information in the structure. As you see, for example, for the namespace data, we have also a type that tells us that it's uh, uint. So this information is, uh, is taken from the, the young data model and is also useful to make the mapping between uh, uh, CBOR and JSON. Because it's something strange or, or funny that we have, we can say that JSON and CBOR are equivalent, but when you, we deal with uh, the young data model, is or is no more the core, the, uh, the case. For example, in coreconf, when you have an int, the int can be an integer, or can be an identity ref, or can be an enumeration. And if you have in a union, you uh, you you know what it is because you have some tags that also allows you to make the disambiguation. But if you don't have union, you just have an integer and you don't know how to convert it. And it's the same thing uh, in the opposite direction. When you have a string in JSON, you don't know if it's a string or if it's an uh, if it's identity ref. So we or have also- Or an integer, actually. Hmm? Or an integer, actually. Or an integer, or a, yeah. The UN64 is a hmm. referred as a, represented hmm. as a string. So <laughs> we think it's very useful yeah. to, to have this because this way we can also and what we do in, uh, in OpenChick is that we, we, we just manipulate uh, core conf structure, but with that, we are able to reconstruct a JSON structure and then apply all the tools that are used to validate uh, the young data model. Nice. Okay. okay, so, so basically I, you, you found a way to extract the essential information in the Yang model and tied to the, the SIDS. Mm. So I'm not entirely sure why you put the type up there and the key mapping down there. It's so key mapping is another structure that is added just after uh, 
the structure you have at the beginning that gives you the list of seeds. So yes, we had, but why is that not in the same place where we have a type? Because the type is just a mapping. Here it's more this key mapping structure is used just to browse the young data model. So all the the core conf file you you have. So it's yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something that, that is huh? semantically equivalent. Huh? Um, so you add information to to uh, one hundred thousand uh, or one million one thirty five hmm. there, and you add it right in that uh, uh, SID record. But down there in the key mapping, you also add information to to yes, uh, one million one or two, but you add it in a separate structure and not in the yes because uh, here it's. For me, it's a totally different algorithm you are playing with. Here, with the, in fact, you key mapping is to, is something that is just used to browse the core conf files to find okay. what you are. Mm -hmm. And if you just have this, you can browse it. So, you so don't even need the other part. This is the minimum information you yeah. need, and the rest is more convenience to make map uh, transformation between yeah. uh, JSON and core conf. But uh, how do you know how to represent the, the 1 million 110 and 1 million 129? This is a regular seed. Uh, I just use a young data model and I say that the range was 1 million. Here the value by itself is just an example. Okay. I don't uh, see what you... Yeah, so you essentially say that uh, I, I leave out the million. Uh, 96 is something that is keyed by a 130 and a 129. Yes, so I have, I have several information in that file. For example, if I have this value, uh, so uh, 96, it means that it's a list in the young data model. Mm -hmm. And this list has two keys. But are the two values that you have in the array? Yes, but when you actually use that, you need to know what type they are. Or... So that's a that's a good question. Uh, yes or no? We can say that the type we have in the core conf file is the same as the type you query, and we trust people. Yes, that's a, a way to do it. Or the other way is to go and see in. Uh, the first list, what is the type that we are using? Right. If we are more suspicious about things we are sending. So that's uh, also a way yeah. to, to, ju to justify both, uh, both value in the seed file. Right. But you could also do a type mapping at the end, which gives you a type for, for every set that has yeah. a type. Yeah, that could be another solution. I'm just thinking about how, how to feed this to to somebody who thinks this SID file has been recently standardized, I hope this week. And uh, so we are, we are already changing it and having new top level entries there is probably less of a problem than, than actually changing the, the entries uh, down there. Anyway, that, that's an interesting idea taking an existing model and, and kind of distilling it to the absolute essence uh, that you need in, in the constraint device to actually work with this. So nice. I'm wondering whether we can learn anything from this in, in other places. Do we have similar opportunities for distilling things that really contain too much information? For me, we we have a very good way with uh, core conf representation to to create protocols, and we have also a, we made some studies about uh, uh, with uh, Rafa from Mercy University about uh, I2 NFS uh, model, and we made mm -hmm. a, a young data model for uh, OSCOR, and we have also good results using uh, this. Mm -hmm.
So do, do we have any idea where we want to get this uh, standardized? <laughs> <laughs> For me, uh, it's, it's a, the way uh, to access to Pyong is still a, a mystery. So we, I, I made the VHAC. I'm not sure it's totally compatible, but maybe we, we can write a, a document to say how to extend uh, the seed file with uh, information to to make uh, for uh, I don't know for embedded device or to have a, a way to 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 automatize totally the the development of objects. I say just create take the young data model and then go to the code. So the the seed file, of course, is described by Yang model. Yeah, and uh, what you're doing here is you're augmenting that Yang model. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, the problem is that when you go through a Yang data model, you have, a, or if you go to look at Pyong, it's quite very, very well written. It's beautiful, and it's like surfing into a, a graph of information, and so it's. Okay. Fantastic, but for uh, constraint devices, maybe too much. Sure. So that's why we, by using just yeah. this information, it could be enough for for small devices. Yeah, I was just wondering mm -hmm. whether this really is a twenty-line Yang model that has a couple of augment statements and tells you where to put stuff into the zip file, so we can standardize this in very in a very short document. Mm -hmm. So for me, key mapping can be an extension, and maybe we can, as you say, uh, take the seed file and, and have, an, have another mapping when we put the seed and, and then the type. Uh, what I don't have hit, for example, for for the type, we have different things. So we have, uh, uh, maybe I have in the next slide some information. But here what we, we did in the representation is that we uh, we have all the type, but we can have also an array. And when we have an array, it's uh, we have uh, all the types that are in the union. And we use also a map. And the map gives the mapping between the number and the enum uh, for for this, mm -hmm. this thing. So we it's more complex. So after that, it's we are playing with the type of the representation. Maybe here we can make something less clever and more generic, but we, we can discuss about that. Um, just a brief procedural mm -hmm. note. Um, I didn't get all of that uh, in the minutes. Um, mm -hmm. If you could look over the where I, where I have the, just a few yeah. dots and question mm -hmm. marks, that would be helpful. Yeah, OK. Yeah, so that's very difficult because we are type of types of uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Not just that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there, there are yeah. so many metals, uh, <laughs> levels of meta here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so mm -hmm. I think we, we can take away from this that, that uh, uh, when we are processing models, we may want to be in a position to actually distill the model to, to just the information that is needed for the particular kind of uh, processing and that, that should be something that is always in the in the uh, view in the um, what we think about uh, when we build these things so so we can get useful abstractions or distillations <laughs> to, to our constraint devices. Nice. Brief question for those who have who who have been lacking way too much context for this. Um, <laughs> is this or the, the binary form of this something that would be sent to the device or is this just something that is consumed by the device firmware building process mm -hmm. and turned into basically fed to the compiler and depending on how smart things are, it might wind up in the binary or it might just be consumed into the compiler's optimization process so what we so it, it depends where we are in the tree so for example we can send the full the full tree so for example here from the root root as a seed and then we say i'm sending you this seed 
and then we send all the information to, to the other end. Or we can just go to the leaf and say we change the value for this leaf with this condition, which means that it's all the path, all the value you need in the path to go to that uh, to that seed. So in that case, still the device. If if the device gets a small update here, it still needs to have the original full tree because otherwise it can't. If it's an update, it. so the yeah you have to get the full tree if you are send it. And uh, say if you have an update, then you just send one part of the tree. So you, you you used the word this in the original question in a way that was uh, kind of ambiguous. Um, the key mapping stuff that, that was on, on the other slide, that is something that you actually would compile into your code. Because the, the code that implements this Yang model uh, actually doesn't have to have the whole Yang model in it. It, it just needs to understand what these SIDs are, because otherwise it's not going to be able to understand the semantics, but these then are just numbers, uh, and be able to navigate uh, in the, the overall structure coming in and the overall structure that is uh, maintained as data addressed locally. And the, the navigation, the, the, the instruction for the navigation can be represented in the scheme of things. But it's not something you would send to someone and, and say, um, here's my navigation tree, now start navigating. Because if you don't know the semantics of what you're navigating, that's not going to give you very much. And, and follow up question to something we've discussed, I think it was in Montreal, it's been a while. Um, does this Yang, so if updates are sent to device and if Shik is used with, um, uh, with Oscor, um, how does the state in which, the, how does the, the updated state wind up in the additional authenticated information of the Oscor messages that are being exchanged because unpacking them will result in, can result in different messages depending on whether or not the updates to the model have been received. That's a good question, and we have to discuss it in the okay. in the working group. What I will say, and my solution, I don't. It's not the group solution. Is for example, when you start an update on a rule, this rule cannot be used until it's at least acknowledged. So if you receive inform, if you don't get the information and you get this rule, you drop it. And this way, you sure that you you have the same rules on both sides. So. Reminds me of the way we, we are updating um, compression context in six, the 6 open mm. compression. There we also have to be careful. As long as we are updating it, as long as there is uncertainty about whether the update reached uh, everyone, we cannot use this particular entry. Mm. Um, Same. We have to fall back to. And, uh, and for, for Oscor, that just means that we'll have to wait until the, the replay window has advanced far enough that we can't be processing old messages anymore. Because Oscar mm -hmm. would otherwise Maybe, yes, tolerate that's, old messages. That's something we, we have to discuss, but it's, uh, uh, we need to, when we do management, we need to, to have some uh, encryption because otherwise uh, anybody <laughs> can do anything. So we have to, and that's one point I will raise during the uh, Chic me meeting is that uh, we will have to do management, and so we will propose a solution, and we will embed uh, encryption and management in some specific rules, a type of rules. Yeah, and you, you really have to sell this as management because once mm -hmm. you enter the an endpoint of the communication is talking to the path about something. Uh, once you enter that realm, you run into political problems. So just, so just call it management. Okay. Yeah, that, this was an interesting brain teaser at the end, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, very nice to, to know this. And of course, I'm going to think about uh, how you actually could use SDF in, in a similar way. Good. I think we have uh, exhausted the contributions for this meeting, and we have 10 minutes left.
So if anybody wants to do a tap dance like Elliot uh, <laughs> uh, proposed, now would be the time. Uh, otherwise, we could give you back 10 minutes of your life and uh, uh, see you around at the hackathon at, and at the ITF. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.